Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Preacher's Corner. I'm Pastor Jay, and today we're going to be diving into the book of Revelation, chapter 21, finishing that chapter off, verse 9 and following. And our subject today, the New Jerusalem. So without further ado, let's dive in. Father, we are grateful for thy blessing. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us this week. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving your people and ask you, Father, to be with us, to bless us, and to increase us in every way as we receive of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, we, we read through this on Tuesday just as a means to be able to, to take a look at this city and get an idea of it before we closed out our session. So today we're going to dive right in. We see in verse number 9, the scripture says, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, if you've, if you've ever heard of a Baptist brider, um, that, that, that's referring to the bride of Christ, is referring to the teachings that we find even right here in Revelation 21, is recognizing the church as being the bride of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is revealed in, in places like Matthew chapter number 22, uh, different places like that, 25, you'll find that... Uh, there's just this thrill of of the promise of the union between Christ and his church is revealed in in Ephesians chapter number 5 concerning the marriage between a man and a woman is Christ and his church given to us by the apostle Paul so a lot of different uh, connections that are shown throughout the scripture and the reason why is because the relationship between God and his people Israel is known in his bride in Jeremiah but also you'll find Christ to the church. And the very first institution that Jesus and that the Father uh, had had made was that of the man and the woman, all the way back in Genesis chapter number 2, where Adam would say from the, the introduction that he receives of Eve, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman and God put them together. So it's the very first institution that we find. So needless to say, the, the coming together of Jesus with his church once more is going to be a glorious affair. It's going to be a beautiful, a beautiful day. And we, the church, shall be adorned as a beautiful bride. It shows us in verse number 10 that he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Uh, one really important point to be made known here is where, where the holy city, Jerusalem, or that great city, is descending from. Now, is is descending. So, needless to say, at current time, it would be there in the palace of the king near where the throne room of God would be. And thus, when, it, when the new heaven and the new earth that we covered on Tuesday have been completed and formed, now this city descends from the place of God's throne down. And what you're going to find is three layers with three persons of the Godhead with three specific groups of people that that shall dwell thereon. So you have that new heaven and that new earth due to the promise of the covenant to Abraham, and you're going to have the covenant people there on the earth, Israel, fulfilled covenants right there. Then you're going to find the new Jerusalem, which is the promise to the church in Jesus Christ, who sits in the midst of this new Jerusalem city, that he is the light thereof, and there's no need for a sun or a moon anymore because he's, Jesus is the light. And, and we understand from what we're about to see that you'll be able to uh, see the, the reflection of his light from the whole earth's perspective and the reflection of his light from the heavenly perspective, I mean, it's going to shine. We also see those martyred saints as was given them a promise in, in, in Revelation chapter number 7, beginning in verse 9 to finish the chapter, you'll find that they dwell in the, in the temple of the Lord, and there is their place of service. And so you've got the martyred saints, you've got the church, and you've got Israel. And with Israel is 
the 144,000 also, they are part, the remnant that was always promised of Israel. So it's very important to understand where people are and what what the blessings are for them. And that, that's pretty sweet because everything with God is done in decent order. Everything has its place. Everything's in its place. Everything works according to his purpose and his plan. And it's just perfect. And you say it couldn't be that perfect. You know, nothing on this earth really is that perfect except those things of God. <laughs> and during this time, it, it literally is going to be perfect. So that's kind of something we have to, to look forward to. And it's pretty exciting. Now... He carries, he carries John away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed him the great city, holy Jerusalem, as descending out of heaven from God. He says that this city is going to have the glory of God as revealed in verse number 11. And her light, the light of the city, was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, as clear as crystal. Also, she had a great high wall with twelve gates and the twelve and twelve angels at the twelve gates, and the names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the beauty of these gates is that each one of those gates you'll see a little bit further on the each one of those gates revealed in verse 21 the 12 gates were 12 pearls each individual gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass so each one of these gates that we're now looking at up here in this uh, verse number 12 is connected to verse 21 is revealing to us these 12 gates are 12 pearls and each one of those uh, was of the name of the twelve tribes, children of Israel. And also you'll understand better that parable that Jesus would refer to called the pearl of great price. And no, that is not uh, referring to the Book of Mormon. <laughs> it's not dealing with the Mormon church at all. And so it comes down, and, and it shows us in verse number 13, three gates east, three gates north, three gates south, three gates west. Verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations. So this city represents the whole of God's people, the whole of God's God's nations. And it tells us that the, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So each one of the gates represents one of the tribes of Israel, and each one of the foundations represents the apostles of Jesus. And so that I believe that you would have that representation also in heaven see, seated at the 24 thrones. So just as the gates and the, and the foundations of the New Jerusalem are those thrones that are represented before the throne of God. As I believe personally as 24 thrones is representing the, the old covenant and the new covenant being together as God's covenant before his throne. Likewise with this New Jerusalem city... You have the gates with the names of the, the tribes of Israel. You have the foundations, which are of the, the 12 apostles. And so you have the 24 represented in the whole of one people. Now, you, you also understand that the church is built upon the apostles and prophets, as it's revealed in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. is The, the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So they're again recognized in this new Jerusalem as the apostles and the prophets, so to speak. The prophets represented the tribes of Israel. He who talked with me, in verse number 15, had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, and the city is measured with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Now, needless to say, 12,000 furlongs roughly guesstimates to about 1,500 miles. <laughs> okay? Uh, not feet, not yards, but 15,500 miles. And keep in mind that that is going to be a thousand 
500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. I mean, it's it's a square, and its length is equal to its breadth. So it's 1,500 miles square, and that's pretty exciting because it's a huge city. It's going to be a lot of people there. Its length, its breadth, and its height are equal. Verse number 16, and it... It's like 1,500 miles, equal. <clears throat> then he measured its wall, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. <laughs> How is tough to say. Uh, is it a man or an angel? If it's an angel, it could be the height of a building. If it's a man, it's just an average height. Roughly about six foot, give or take five inches either way for the majority of the world. And so you have this <clears throat> you have this issue right here where he says he measured its walls, 144 cubits. Now, this wall is really exciting because you have the city. It's 1,500 miles high. Then you have this wall, which is just outside of the city, that's surrounding the city, and... and it's about 75, uh, I think it was 75 feet uh, tall. So you've, you've got this, this New Jerusalem was 1,500 miles tall, and then you've got this wall that surrounds it that's gorgeous. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the, the, the jasper stones being referred to here by, by many of the commentaries and the scholars that I've been re researching to look into is a stone very, very common to being equivalent to diamond. So, needless to say, you've got this wall, and, and, and it's completely made of diamond. So, as this jasper, jasper stone or this particular diamond, one of the things that we know about diamonds is that they produce a prism effect when they are cut stone, and the light reflects or refracts, I should say, through through the the cuttings on the edges so you can you can then put a picture in your mind of Jesus sitting in the midst of this new Jerusalem with the with the Shekinah that that eminence of his glory shining out of this building and and his light coming through this this jasper stone wall and and needless to say a prism color effect going out into the world where all of the colors we would be able to see of the prism would be would be painting the sky. So that would be amazing in itself. He says the construction of the wall was was of jasper, and the city itself is of pure gold like clear glass, which is why when Jesus shines, uh, his light will shine through the walls of that city. Is that The city is of such a purity of gold as that it is pure like clear glass. And so you would say, well, that's impossible for that to, to exist because we know that the, the purer the gold, the more we can refine gold through our processes uh, on the earth, the flimsier it gets. There's no possible way that a city could potentially be built out of a gold that would be so pure from, from the impurities that, that our earth has in the ore that, that it could certainly make a wall that would be able to be a city and in, in fact that would be 1500 miles wide with each each floor so to speak of this this 1500 mile high condominium compacting in weight upon the other there's no possible way that this city could could remain standing but we fail to remember that we're not dealing with those things of the earth anymore. We're not dealing with the imperfection, the impurity. We're not dealing with the corruption of, of nature because that was all burned up. Remember, we go back to Revelation chapter 20 at the beginning of Revelation 21. After the judgment of Revelation 20, moving into that new heaven and that new earth, everything gets burned up. Everything gets gets made new. It's a brand new heaven. It's a brand new earth. Everything, all of the laws of 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 physics, all of the the laws of science entirely have just been revamped. They've just been renewed. So this gold obviously is going to be of a of a perfected state, and in its purity, it's going to be like 
clear glass, and that's going to be exciting. And the Jasper Stone is not going to have the impurities that, that we have as found in diamonds today and the impurities that would be therein. That It's, it's going to be perfect, literally perfect in every, every respect. And so that the foundations, as we move down to verse number 19, and the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first was of jasper, of course we were talking about that, and the second is a sapphire, which is a beautiful, can be, it's multiple colors depending, but it can be a beautiful, beautiful blue stone. It's very powerful, a sapphire. The third was Chastlodoni. The fourth is Emerald. Of course, you know that that rainbow of o over the head of God in, in Revelation 4 is like Emerald. So it's going to be this gorgeous kind of green hue to it. The Sardonyx, the Sardius, the Chrysolite, the, the Beryl Stone, the Topaz, which happens to be my, my birthstone in November, the Topaz, the the chrysoprase and the jacinth, which is another stone that, that is red, another beautiful red stone, and the amethyst, which, of course, is going to be, I think it's, what, uh, February's birthday, but the amethyst is, is a beautiful purple stone. These just gorgeous, gorgeous colors that are going to be coming out of the wall of this city and it's it's amazing the foundations of the wall then of course we talked about the 12 gates or or each were 12 pearls and each individual gate was one pearl and the street and the city was pure gold like transparent glass so your your walls of the city are pure gold and the streets of the city are pure gold, and understanding that Jesus being in the midst of this city and Jesus being the light thereof, if the base of the city, if the foundations have those those multitude of different color stones that we just understood from above, but that those stones have zero impurities like the stones that we dig up out of the ground today, where we have to do a great deal of polishing and a great deal of cutting and a great great deal of crafting the stones in order to make them beautiful little gems that we would have faceted into our gold and silver uh, things, then, then those stones be absolutely pure, so to speak, that, that, that the light of Jesus would be able to shine through those stones, then you have the brilliance of God literally shining through the walls of the city, shining through the, the sides of, uh, of the exterior wall, through the floor of the city, through the 12 foundation stones. I mean, it's um, breathtaking. It's going to be breathtaking, literally. For those that dwell upon the earth that see the, the glory of God and all of its splendor and the perfection of its beauty uh, as they look up to the heavens and they see this technicolor light show coming out of the New Jerusalem, those that live in the New Jerusalem who come into it and go out of it that, that live in that technicolor just glory in that, that moment and for those that are in the throne room of God and in his temple above that new Jerusalem, like the martyred saints that are able to look down upon the technicolor glory of, of the, the centerpiece. Literally, this is, this is basically a centerpiece from God. And, and he's, he's just literally sharing his glory through his son, just as he did in the Old Testament, just as he did in the New Testament, just as he will in, in this time after everything is made new, that he will share the glory of his Son with all of his creation, with all of mankind. And, and it's just, we're going to be in the splendor of his glory. It's just going to be amazing. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. It's just amazing. He said that the city had no need of a sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the, the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Well, hallelujah. Uh, verse 22, above that, it says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. 
So this city, it has no necessity of of having a temple like what is above it in the, in the throne room of God, which he has his temple there, which is where this city comes out of. But the city itself has no need of a temple because it's it's literally the city that Jesus dwells in. The, the, the city itself is a temple. It's like, like your body. The Apostle Paul would say, don't you understand that you are the temple of God? It's like, very important for us to understand is that the God himself, just like Jesus, will dwell in the midst of this city, and this will be his city. He will be one in essence with this this city. God himself, in essence, is one with you. He's living inside of you. He's sealed you by the Holy Spirit of his promise, and, and, and he's very much with you and a part of you and, and, and in you because of his desire to, uh, to have connection with you and, and reach the world through you. So it's very important to understand that there's no necessity of a temple in this place because the place itself is the temple. It's the temple of Jesus. And he's inside of you. And you are the temple of God. That's, that's pretty exciting. It comes down and it says that the city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminates it. Needless to say, the Lamb is its lights. What we've been talking about here for the last couple of minutes is that, that Jesus is literally going to be the glory of, of the whole world. Jesus is going to be shining through it. It's going to be a gorgeous scenario there. And verse number 24, the nations of those who are saved. That's really exciting. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Now, nations of the earth, or nations of those who are saved, kings of the earth. Okay, so this is where you find those, those different placements and different people groups but all one in Christ, so that Christ is literally in the middle between the martyred saints who died for the for his testimony and, and their faith in the Lamb that are up in, in the throne room of God, and for the covenant people of Israel that, that are down on the earth and represented the twelve tribes of Israel on the earth and the kings of the earth, needless to say, they... That's their place that they've been given, the royal priesthood uh, and, and servants of the kings. So they're kings of the earth. And then there's the martyred saints. Now, both of those were looking. Uh, the martyred saints were looking back to the cross, of course. And, and the covenant Israel was looking to the cross, of course. Then you have this center section of people that are known as the Bride of Christ, or recognized as the church. And there they are with Jesus. As in this life they came to Christ, they have received the Lord, they are following after his teachings and, and serving him in this life. Theirs is to be with the Lord forever, as he had made promise there in John chapter number 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house, are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am, there you may be also. Very important points that Jesus makes there is so that the people of of the tribulation are, are looking down upon the glory of the city. The people of, of covenant Israel are looking up to the glory of the city. And the people of Christ united together with him in the city. <laughs> They're in the city. And so there's, there's just no need for the temple because it is the temple. And, and Jesus is literally suspended between heaven and earth as to be the glory of both. The glory of it all. That's so exciting. And we're working off of, of ideas at this point. You realize that. We're working off of, of imagery that is born in our thoughts and in our minds that God has given us the, the words to be able to structure these things as we can see them 
just within our soul because no one's ever seen this before. No one's ever experienced this before. Granted, those that be in the throne room of God right now may have a, a glimpse of it, may have an understanding of it, but you and I, none of us have ever been there. So we we don't see this. We don't we we can't possibly experience this until it be our time to be a part of it. But this is the beauty of why God has given us such detail, such imagery, and through the writing of his scriptures, because he's literally giving us a taste of the place that we shall dwell in. He's giving us a, a glimpse of the glory that is to come, and I believe it's for the purpose of strengthening us for for strengthening our faith so that we remain steadfast looking to him trusting in him uh, because we know that whatever it is that we face the rest of our days on this earth that we have a glory that we're about to get into that cannot be compared to anything close even the most wealthy person with their billion dollar mansions with all of their 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 glories and cars and boats and helicopters and planes and all this other junk that they amass can't even come close to comparing to the glory of one of the rooms that would be in this new Jerusalem there with Jesus. Can't even come close. Oh, oh, whatever that, that evangelist is, that it, that he's just got to have a, a, a jet of his own, of like a $54 million jet, just buy me the jet, buy me the fuel, I can't fly with the rest of the the common masses because they're demons waiting to eat me or something crazy like that. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers that just shell out the bucks to buy this guy a jet. None of that stuff is going to be even close to be able to be compared to the glory of, of just the gates of the city that God's church will be will be dwelling in. I mean... We try so hard to have so much. We'll we'll wear our heart out. We'll wear our bodies out. We'll we'll destroy our lives, our families' lives. Our we'll 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 give up our own soul in many ways just so that we can have more in this life. Not realizing that there is a promise of a life to come. One, that isn't temporary. It's going to be eternal. Two, it's going to be in, in a, a state of perfection that cannot be compared to by any imperfections on this earth and three it's it's given to us by our father simply because there's no possible way that it could be earned in any measure or form that's oh that's just god and that's just the craziness of man and so it comes down and he says that the the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Ah, oh, that's a thrill. Nations, by the way, is you understand that every every tongue, every tribe, every nation. What what you're getting a glimpse of here is that what makes us distinct on earth will still exist in heaven. Africans will still be African, so to speak. There's going to be red and yellow, black and white, because they're all precious in His sight. It's not like we're going to have some kind of angelically heavenly body where we all look the same we all all are like carbon copy the same no we're we're going to be who we are only perfect which is really exciting you're going to have all nations represented in heaven and you're going to know their na nationality so to speak they're going to they're going to look the way that they look god didn't create you onto this earth god didn't bring you through the womb of your your parent your moms on this earth uh, to then be transformed into something else he made you the way you are and god loves you by the way he made you and so we're going to have asians we're going to have africans we're going to have europeans we're going to have we're going to have all of these major people groups with all of their various colors and all of their 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 glory is going to be really exciting we will all be able to understand each other. We will all be able to speak the same language as the heavenly language of God. We will have a perfect mind. 
we will have a perfect love. We will have a perfect, perfect attitude of service to one another. And, and it will be perfect in that day. Man, I'm looking forward to it. Ah, and it's gates. Verse 25, its gates shall not be shut at all by day. And we're not even going to talk about a night. He said there shall be no night there. <laughs> not going to be dark. Not going to be a night. It's just going to be Jesus. And that's going to be perfect. And its gates will never be shut. Now, there's an interesting place that we're going to get to in Revelation chapter 22, which will come up, uh, well, we'll get into it definitely tomorrow, but then we may end up stretching to Monday with that. But th there's this place in Revelation 22 that talks about these gates, and there's people that are on the outside of these gates that aren't going to be allowed inside of these gates. But we'll get to that when we hit Revelation 22. Needless to say, the gates themselves shall not be shut at all, and those gates shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Very important, the praise of the Lord and, and the shouting of His praise and, and the, the church in itself being able to go in and out of those gates as, as is at the pleasure of the Lord and at the pleasure of the church. And by the way, the church itself is represented by the nations, isn't it? Well, there's the church in the Asiatic countries. There's a church in the African countries. There's a church in the European nations. There's a church in, the, in, in everywhere, the island nations. There's a church in the Americas. It's, it's all over the world, isn't it? The glory of God represented in the church is all over the world. And we'll all be together in one place at this point. But there shall by no means, another warning here, verse number 27 is another warning, there shall by no means enter it into it anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie. Nothing's going to come through these gates. That is, that is going to be at once wicked or had been wicked. Nothing, nothing. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's it. It's the only ones. Now, who are they? As, as this new Jerusalem would be the home of the church. That doesn't necessarily mean that the church is the only ones who are going to dwell within it. In other words, be able to come in and out of it. This, this does show us that, that those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are allowed passage through it. But the, the defining factor of, of that, those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, are those that are not defiled and those that, that do not cause abomination or lie. So, <clears throat> who's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? First questions first. All who are looking to Messiah would be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, for the Lamb is the Messiah. So we would find that written in the Lamb's Book of Life are people of the Old Covenant like David, like Solomon, like Samuel, and, and many of the, the saints of the Old, like Abraham, like Job, and, and many of th those guys, Jacob even. Though he lived a life of deception, Jacob even, being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we find that, that much, of the, well, the old covenant that was faithful in Israel, that had been delivered by God in the first resurrection, that we saw back there in, in Matthew chapter number 27, as they walked the streets of Jerusalem from their resurrection, uh, those guys written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How about the church? Certainly those of the church age that have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are written directly by Jesus into the Lamb's book of life. For he has received us unto himself to be a peculiar priesthood. And so how about the martyred saints? You bet those guys are written in the Lamb's book of life. There wouldn't be anyone present before the Lord that wouldn't be written in that book as we discovered in Revelation 20. 
Those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire, and that was the second death. And so this city, uh, excitingly enough, and this is a new area of exploration for me as well, this city is going to be a place where all peoples, rather the the Old Covenant, rather the New Covenant, rather the martyred saints, this place where Jesus sits in the midst of it is going to be the city. It's going to be the 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 intersection between all three people groups of God where everyone will be able to come and dwell together and worship the Lord, the Lamb, together as one. So the gates will never be closed because the worship will never be done. We'll always be there to praise. Something to think about, isn't it? Something to think about. And at that point, I'm going to read uh, Revelation chapter number 22 from verses 1 to 5, and we'll be done for this day. And he showed me, in verse number 1, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What a thrill. Guys, what a thrill that you, you would see this pure river, the water of life. And remember what Jesus was saying to the woman at the well in John chapter number 4 as he asked the woman for water because he's thirsty. And she said, uh, do you forget where you're at? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Why are you asking me for water? And Jesus said, if you had known who you were talking to, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. And she said, um, the well's deep and you don't have a bucket. And then she said, are you greater than our, our father Jacob who dug this well? And, and, that, and he talked about that well of water springing up unto everlasting life. And then she said, well, give me this water. <laughs> I don't want to thirst again. Well, that is the beauty that is revealed here, that pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The, this waterfall that's coming out of the throne of God and dropping down into the new, the new Jerusalem, that new city that's flowing through the main, main street where Jesus' throne is. The water of God is a waterfall coming down and to the throne of Jesus, which then proceeds from the throne of Jesus down to the earth. This is this multiple uh, level waterfall of, the, of this water of life. And, and what a glory that it is in the middle of its street on either side of the river you'll find the tree of life and the tree of life is beautiful because it's 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 fruit changes and as you can see if you ever wanted to track time in heaven which is a timeless environment where we know we don't have to worry about time anymore because we'll be uh, immortal as the the statement would be we'll be in a state of perfection and death will no longer have a hold on us we'll still be able to track time I know that, that, that it was often said that there was no possible way the song could be true of Amazing Grace as John Newton would write in, in his last stanza of the song. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. You say, well, how would you, how would you know when you could mark 10,000 years? Well, at, at current scale of keeping time, we in, in the Western world, we carry 12 months to make a whole year. 365 days, 12 months, 52 weeks, right? That puts together our year. Now, understanding that in the middle of this street on verse number two and on either side of the river was a tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month you got 12 months in heaven 
<laughs> you just track the changing of the fruits and you'll be able to do that because you'll be enjoying this fruit for a whole month and then you'll have another fruit that begins to grow off of the same tree and you'll be able to enjoy that fruit. And if you keep track of the 12 fruits, you might like one more than the rest. So you'll be waiting for that one to come back around. Uh, you'll be able to keep 10,000 years time tracked just by this tree. And I love the leaves of this tree were for the healing of the nations. I love that. The healing of the nations. Be able to eat those leaves and what a joy it will be. No more curse done away with. God and the Lamb are right in the middle of this throne. And we will be able to serve Him and praise Him and rejoice in Him. Oh, it's going to be a day. In verse 4, we're going to see His face. We're going to see His face. That's going to be worth it all. Father, we thank you for the beauty of, of your new Jerusalem. And I'm certain, Lord, that we didn't do it justice. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's so many different things that we could talk about. The individual colors, the stones, the, 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 the glory of the perfection. I mean, there's so much that we could talk about that we just don't have time for. But, Father, we give you praise for what you have given us in the time that we have together. We give you praise for for this promise, this hope that we have in Christ, that we may be able to rejoice in the Lamb. Lord, we, we thank you for everything you've, you've shown us and what a beautiful day it has become. We pray that you will bless us the rest of this day, that we may live it well and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys, keep you guys, and cause His face to shine upon you. And I'll catch you tomorrow for the wrap-up of Revelation in chapter 22. Till then, take care.